Hey guys, OpenGL has a bad reputation of being quite hard to learn, despite being the simplest graphics API out there. It feels like there's just a lot of concepts to get into your head around when you start to get even a basic triangle on the screen. It's nowhere near as insanely verbose as Vulkan, but it still is pretty tough to keep track of everything necessary. It's because of all of these things that people don't really consider OpenGL for small scale games, like for game jams. People seem to much prefer Unity or other game engines. If the only reason for using a game engine for a small game is the rendering, there is a way out for you. In this video, I'd like to showcase a very simple rendering API that I've been using for the past year. It has gone through no less than 12 iterations through 5 different languages. It is simple to use, simple to write, and easy to extend as well. So let's just get into it. I'm going to be showing all this in C. I'm using my code base, but you can use whatever windowing library and OpenGL function loading library you would like. Step 1 is the basic renderer structure, which for now looks like this. It contains all the OpenGL objects required, that is, the shader program, buffer, and vertex array, and a projection matrix. It also contains a tightly packed buffer of data, which we will sync with the GPU every frame. For now, the render vertex will just be this. We will revisit this when we add texture support. The first function to fill out is render init. We can generate and bind a vertex array, then generate and bind a buffer. The last line here is important. We allocate a set amount of data on the GPU. The size will be max vertices times size of the render vertex. Let's quickly define max vertices. We won't do that directly, but we'll have another hash defined before this uh, to define the max triangles. I'll just define it to be 2048, but this is completely configurable. Max vertices will just be max triangles times 3. Now we can calculate a projection matrix. I'll keep it standard for now with a 1 to 1 pixel to OpenGL coordinates ratio with the origin at the bottom left. Let's work on shader loading next. We create a program and the vertex and fragment shader modules. I'll use my own functions here for nice of file loading, but GL shader source call should be normal. Next, we can compile the shaders and check for errors. Now we can attach the shader to the main program and link it together. We also should check for errors again, just in case. We can actually immediately detach and delete our shaders from the program. The actual shader objects only refer to the shader code in strings. Since we have already compiled and linked to the program, we already have a working shader program. So we have no need for the actual shader code. Finally, we'll upload our projection matrix to the shader for that, we have to use the program, get the uniform location, and use that for setting the projection. Believe it or not, that is the end of the init function. This isn't that bad for a single OpenGL init function at all, and it is the biggest function we have to write. You may be wondering what the shaders look like. For now, since we don't support textures yet, they're this simple. Let's implement dinit, or rather the free function. Of course, here we delete the OpenGL objects we created in the init function. We technically don't need to do this, since it is done by the OS automatically, but I think it's good to keep the lifetime under your control. Next is the render begin frame function. All this one will do now is reset the triangle count to zero. We will be rebuilding all the data every time, which may seem inefficient, but is completely fine. If you do notice a frame hiccup and find out that this system is the bottleneck, then you can switch over to persistent multiple batches. But from my experience, I know that managing the add and remove for batches is extremely cumbersome and is a pain to manage correctly. The render end frame function isn't as simple, but is still pretty trivial. We bind the buffer and then sync our CPU side data with the GPU side data using GL buffer subdata. Then we bind a shader program and vertex array, and finally issue the draw call using GL draw arrays. For anybody curious about why I'm not using index buffers here, 
It's because the basic atom of the render is a triangle. An atom in this case means the smallest thing that our render works on. And for triangles, it's inefficient to use indices since they just take up space and provide no benefit. If we were using something more complex than triangles or quads though, then and only then would we see any benefit to using indices. Now for our actual drawing function. What does it do? The only basic function I'll add for now is the render push triangle function, which does take in a few arguments. We'll have a helper API on top of this function for easy calls, but the most low level call would be this one. Here we have to actually add our data to the CPU side buffer. This is pretty simple as well. All we have to do is this. We simply index into the right place into the triangle data array and set its members accordingly. We mustn't forget to increment triangle count here. There is one more consideration to be made. What if the statically sized buffer is full? Well, we need to accommodate that case somehow. In the past, I had separated the triangle data and triangle count into a separate struct called a batch and held a list of those batches in the renderer. But there is a much simpler way of handling this, albeit crude. We simply just end the frame and begin it again, effectively flushing our batch. Now we will have space for additional triangles without any added complexity. Of course, there are pros to going with the batches row, like sorting, but we won't have that in this video. So to handle this case, we just add this to the start of the push triangle function. And uh, that's it. Bending simple triangles really isn't that hard. And we have fit all this in <laughs> precisely 169 lines of code. Well, rendering colored triangles isn't that impressive still. We also should support textures, which we'll work on next. So, to handle texturing, we will need some additional members in our renderer struct. Namely, the textures themselves stored by OpenGL ID and a use texture count. We will have a maximum of 8 textures allowed to be bound in one draw call, but this is configurable as well. We will also need to have more attributes, namely the UVs and a unique one called texture index. The UV should be self-explanatory, but the texture index one isn't really common. Basically, the way the system works is like this. Whenever you want to render a triangle, we take in an OpenGL texture by a U32 ID. This will be what OpenGL's glgen-texture function returns. When we receive a triangle to draw, we go through the textures already added to the renderer that frame and return the index of where said texture is placed. The texture index. If the texture hasn't been added yet, uh, it can just be added at the end of the array and its last index is returned. This is the index that will be uploaded as the texture index attribute. So why do all this? Well, textures need to be bound, and what we can do is bind all the textures added to the renderer that frame to the same index OpenGL texture slots. Now, in the shader, it's simply a matter of sampling from the texture slot indicated by the texture index attribute. So, for this, we first add our two new attributes to the render vertex, and add them as the attribute 3 and 4 using more GL vertex attribute pointer calls. Now we can go down to our push triangle function and actually take in the texture and UVs as arguments and set the triangle data appropriately as well. Now we have to actually implement the logic to get the texture index. We add this to the start of the function. Basically, we can iterate from 0 to the currently filled in texture slots and check if the texture is already added. If it is, we can simply set our text index to that index. If we don't find it though, we can add it at the first available spot. One thing to be mindful of here is that we have another condition for the renderer data being full. Either our buffer is completely full, or we have reached the maximum amount of textures possible. The way this logic is structured, we can see whether a slot for the current texture has been found by checking if the text index is set to anything other than 1248 which is just my error value. So we can add this new full batch condition to our previous if statement that flushes the renderer. Let's head to the render end frame function next.
What we are going to do here is bind all the textures that were added to the renderer this frame. You can exploit the fact that GL Texture 0, GL Texture 1, etc. are one after another. So we can just add the index to GL Texture 0 to get the corresponding enum required. We also have to remember to reset the texture count to 0 in the render begin frame function. Let's go to the shader next and make it work with the textures. In the vertex shader, we can simply take in the new vertex attributes and pass them along to the fragment shader. The fragment shader, though, is a bit complicated. We take in the two new inputs here. And now we need a new uniform variable. Unfortunately, OpenGL doesn't allow you to sample from any slot you wish using an integer or float index. You need to use a number with the type sampler to D. And double, unfortunately, GLSL doesn't allow passing sampler 2Ds through vertex attributes. This is why we need to have this weird float texture index thing, which we will be converting to integer shortly. So what we need is a uniform sampler 2D array, which we can index into using our texture index. Now for the triple whammy. Some GPUs literally do not allow dynamic integer indexing into arrays. What that means is instead of something sane like this, we have to do this stupid switch statement. Yep, it looks ugly, but there's really not a way around this. So, in total, the fragment shader will look something like this. The last thing to do here is just actually set this uniform. So, let's go to the end of the init function, and we can initialize this array of integers and upload it to the utex uniform. The final thing to do is enable alpha blending so that textures with alpha actually work correctly. And that's it! 183 lines of code in total only. Well, more counting the shaders, but still, it is sub 250 LOC, which is pretty damn concise. Of course, rendering just triangles is quite inconvenient, and passing all the data this function needs is even more inconvenient, so we can add some helpers on top. Here I've just written a function to draw a full texture on a quad. It simply calls the draw triangle with the appropriate data twice. Again, similar to before, I added helper to draw subtextures and use it to add a draw string function. So you can see in just like 50 lines of code, I could add string rendering, which many people have trouble with adding in their own renders because they have added some weird abstraction on everything. The power of this API comes when you realize that you don't have to conform to that abstract system. This is as bare bones as you can get, and it being trivial to extend and build upon in such a way is exactly why I've been using this system for the past few projects. To test this out, I ported over testers that I've written before to use this render. I truly hope you got some inspiration for your own renders from mine. That being said, that's all for today. See ya.